Good morning and welcome to the special edition of INSA's Coffee and Conversation with Peter Mattis and Megan Woff of the Special Competitive Studies Project. And now, please welcome INSA's Vice President for Policy, Larry Hanauer. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for a special edition of INSA's Coffee and Conversation. This morning, we're pleased to welcome two leading intelligence thinkers to our program. But before we begin, I wanna make a couple of housekeeping notes. If you have questions, please submit them through the questions box on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll do our best to get to everyone's questions, permitting, uh, time permitting. We're pleased to welcome members of the press on the call today. So this is a reminder that today's program is on the record. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers, Peter Mattis, Director for Intelligence, and Megan Waff, Associate Director for Intelligence with the Special Competitive Studies Project. Founded in October 2021, the Special Competitive Studies Project, or SCSP, is a bipartisan, nonprofit initiative focused on strengthening America's long-term competitiveness for a future where artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies reshape our national security, economy, and society. Last week, the organization released its Intelligence Interim Panel Report, which argues the IC faces four critical impediments to change, which we'll talk about this morning. A link to the report has been dropped in the chat, and you can find it at the SCSP's website, which is scsp.ai. Our two speakers bring years of experience to their roles. Peter Mattis previously served as a senior advisor for global democratic resilience at the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs, and as the staff director of the Congressional Executive Commission on China. Peter's also worked at the Jamestown Foundation, the National Bureau of Asian Research, and the CIA. Megan Waff was a Fulbright grantee in Malaysia and previously worked for the Department of Commerce and US Congress. And she's a graduate of the illustrious Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, so go Jumbos. Peter and Megan, welcome. Good morning, Larry. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Great, good morning. Um, so let me just start with, uh, just to get an understanding of, of, of the, the main challenges that you found uh, and analyzed in the report. So the SESP, is a follow-on to the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence and was created to promote American competitiveness and to recommend ways that the United States could counter the impact of our adversaries' technological advancements in national security-related spheres. So can you briefly explain the challenges you examined and the importance of bolstering the intelligence community's use of emerging technologies to counter these challenges? Right, well, thanks, Larry. The I think you would say that SESP goes a little bit broader than, than national security. I mean, that was the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. And SESP sort of draws on its heritage from the, the Rockefeller Special Studies Project in the 1950s. Hmm. Remember, Nelson Rockefeller left government and had a sense that the Eisenhower administration was doing some of the right things, but it wasn't maybe thinking about the next administration or the one after that. And so he had decided that if we're involved in this sort of this struggle that is going to go past the next couple of administrations, may even be a generational struggle, um, that we really ought to be trying to draw the best that the United States has to offer to discuss the various features of it, right? And the and the Rockefeller Special Studies Project talked about education, it talked about society and democracy, it talked about foreign policy, it talked about national defense, right? So it's not just a national security endeavor. And like the, the Rockefeller Special Studies Project, SCSP has six different panels. Um, one is foreign policy, one is obviously intelligence, another defense, economy, society, and future tech platforms, right? Because competitiveness is, is more than just a national security issue. It's certainly much more than an intelligence issue. And you can't confine it to government as, as, part, of, as part of- So you're really it. taking a whole of nation approach to the problem. Yeah, and and maybe better to say a whole of democracy approach, uh, right? Because it's not just government. It's you know how do we build public-private partnerships? You know, might be a might be kind of a theme of of every panel's work of you know what does this look like to promote foreign policy? What does this look like to promote national defense? What does this look like to have a healthy functioning democracy as we try to govern these govern artificial intelligence and the other emerging technologies that are coming out? You know, faster than we're able to, to think of, of how we should apply them, how we should apply them. 
So you know, with respect with respect to intelligence, though, I think we've we would put four kind of big imperatives for change. I wouldn't say that these are barriers to change. Um, we're not really in the business of of trying to to be too critical or to, or to focus on on what's holding us back, but how can we how can we move forward? Um, and the, these imperatives for change really, I think, are the the intensifying geopolitical rivalry with with the People's Republic of China, in particular. But you could you could frame it in that larger struggle of of democracy and autocracy, and what it, you know what do we want sort of, what do we want the world to look like? The second would be that if we're involved in a in a competition that places technology at the center, how do we ensure that we have that data? And information and insight coming into our into the intelligence community, coming into our government. I mean, just to since we're all in the the DC area, you know, if you think about national defense, almost everything you would need to know is probably within a 15 mile radius of of where the three of us are sitting, right? But if you think about what use of U.S. technological expertise and you know what what this nation is capable of in the scientific field, technologically how the US economy works, how the global economy works, right? This is a this is a set of information that you, you know that a much smaller proportion would be with in that same 15 mile radius. Right. And so there's some you know we we're trying to think of what are the ways that we can be harnessing American expertise broadly defined on on these issues to inform inform intelligence and inform inform policy. The third is the emergence of of new tools, including AI, that that enable collection, analysis, process, and dissemination of intelligence. How can we how can we make good use of these things? And finally, you know, as we as has been in the headlines, um, we have this problem with with sort of relentless efforts to shape and undermine democracy through through influence campaigns, some of which are some of which are disinformation, and others like the Department of Justice showed us yesterday, are there to derail so you know, the functioning of rule of law and the rest of our system, right? So it's a, it's there's a substantial tech piece to that challenge, but it's also got some very traditional aspects to it as well. Right. Good. All right. Well, I hope uh, during the course of the discussion, I'd like to get to sort of all of these topics, you know, the, the broader uh, sort of democracy versus autocracy uh, kind of debate, but then also these questions of how to use technology to advance democratic interests and also U.S. national security in the process. So uh, on that first topic, sort of the, the broader um, uh, you know, importance of democracy, you, you write the report captures um, quite clearly that the intelligence community's um, ethos of objectivity, I think you call it, provides the United States with an advantage over authoritarian uh, adversaries, um, mostly because our adversaries' intelligence services are beholden to party party ideologies or, or compelled to uh, endorse the autocratic leader's whims. So given that, is it possible for the United States to compete with authoritarian governments uh, in technology and in national security while still maintaining a values-based approach to intelligence, technology, cyber operations, and, and the rest? Or is is trying to play by you know some system of rules and norms that isn't really codified, sort of like trying to fight with one hand tied behind our back. I guess the question then is is that is that commitment to democracy and and a rules based order a strength or is it potentially a weakness? Well, as a as a recovering intelligence analyst, you know, as you know, the answer to a, an or question is always yes. But <laughs> I think in this case, we can be. I think we can be fairly sure that democracy is a strength, right? There are there are, there are some weaknesses, there are some restrictions, but are those really bad things? Are we, you know, the fact that we're that we have some some form of ethics, some sense of proportionality in in our thinking and in our system is not necessarily bad. And we've done this we've done this before for an extended period of time. When you think about the fight against fascism. You know that began in the late 1930s and obviously runs through World War II. You have a very intense period, and it's very clear that the United States could make mistakes and then recognize that those were not mistakes that were worth repeating, and that those those violations of democratic values of governance were in essence problems that undermined the strength of democracy, undermined our ability to have 
to benefit from the very best that the United States has to offer from every race, from every creed. Mm -hmm. And I think you can see that there's sort of a steady expansion of citizenship and participation in national competitiveness over over the time period. And when you look, when you think about what the U.S. government looked like in the 1940s and 1950s, and you think about what it looks like now, it's much more reflective of our nation as a whole than it, than it was before. You know, so the Doolittle report might have said that hitherto sort of acceptable norms of human conduct are, are out the window, but it's pretty clear that the United States functioned best when it had, you know, a governance system that was working, that that the checks and balances and oversight and authorities and appropriations were balanced and that there was sort of partnerships among our political class and business class to think about national competitiveness. Mm -hmm. Let me take that question and, and sort of dive a little bit deeper into the weeds because some in your report, you also talk about the importance of um, that, you know, if one of the strengths of a democracy is a, is a diverse um, uh, population that has a diverse range of experiences and skills, you do talk in the report about the challenges of clearing people who have foreign ties, whether, you know, family, work ties, living abroad, whatever. Uh, and in fact, you cite an INSA report um, that we wrote um, on the, the challenges of clearing people with those foreign connections. So uh, how does the community uh, sort of balance that tension, though, between the security that we worry about, about, you know, foreigners infiltrating our uh, systems, like we saw in the indictments that the Justice Department um, uh, issued yesterday, but also needing to draw on the, the human capital experience that that is the strength of a democracy? Well, let's, you know, as someone who came, came out of the counterintelligence side, I'm not going to downplay the, the security risks that are there, but I think there are a few different pieces to, to consider. The first is like the indictments yesterday, those were traditional intelligence operations to target individuals and to and to gather gather sensitive information or useful information and put it in the hands of, of PRC decision makers at mm -hmm. the at the appropriate levels, right? That's a very traditional sort of problem. And we can we can deal with that one. We understand what that what that threat is. The issue with foreign the issue with foreign ties is that we know we know that some countries, um, in particular, are willing to exploit those ties. I mean, I remember some of the the public reporting out there about the Larry Wu Tai Chin case, the the Chinese translator who was recruited by Chinese intelligence, I think, in the 40s, and was eventually arrested in 1985. Right. He one of the things that he was asked for by his by his handlers was. For CIA, the names of CIA employees and their family members back in the PRC as a way as a way to provide leverage. I think you know when you when you're dealing with that kind of problem, I think there we have to acknowledge that we're not going to be coming up with the same sort of solutions that it works for betting someone who's lived entirely in the United States and traveled. Right. And it, and the way that I would frame the security question is that I think a lot of a lot of IC leaders and others on that are sort of stakeholders in the intelligence community have, have sort of sat back and let the security side determine what the risks are and how to manage them, rather than trying to set the bar of this is what we need to be able to do. You know, for example, we should be able to bring in someone who lived and worked in the PRC for 10 years. And how do how do we do that? How do we do that safely, securely? How do we know that that American is sort of patriotic? Periodic, willing to serve for all the for all the right reasons, and if the answer is that well, there's absolutely no way we couldn't possibly come up with a single thing here. Are all of the way, different ways in which we've tried it, then that brings us back to a different question, which is a little bit security related but different. Okay, if we need to have expertise on the PRC, how do we do it, and how are we going to build this if we can't naturally rely on on this expertise? So I think that's the that those are the two sides of the security problem. On the one side, you know, set a clear benchmark of yeah. something that's difficult for bringing in required expertise and knowledge. And if that is a challenge that can't be met, then to look at the other means that, that the IC has to cultivate expertise and to build it in sort of deliberate and appropriate ways. Right. So it's really shifting to a risk mitigation strategy rather than a risk avoidance strategy whenever possible. Yeah, and I and I think it's also setting a high benchmark. You know, let's give let's give the security system goals because in some cases, 
in some cases, the fundamentals of the system are, are decades old and we're looking at some of the same ways, some of the same things in the same ways or maybe slightly enhanced ways um, and monitoring some of the things that we know could be triggers or that could signal, signal vulnerabilities with continuous vetting. But it's the same, it's, it's still the same set of questions. So, yeah. and, we've, and we've only, as the counterintelligence threat from the, the People's Republic of China has gotten worse, we've only gotten more reluctant in terms of figuring this out. And I remember I was, I remember a young man named Glenn Duffy Shriver who studied in China, was recruited by the Ministry of State Security and paid $70,000 to apply to the State Department and CIA, right? So it's a real risk that not everyone who goes over to China to study is Glenn Duffy Shriver, right? And we should be able to, you know, if it's only one out of 10, you know, God forbid that the number was that high. Yeah. But, I would hope that our system is able to weed out at least five of those people that are, you know, would be, you know, perfectly yeah. happy and useful and productive members yeah. of the community. Well, INSA does a good deal of work on security clearance reform and the continuous vetting. So we'll we'll stay on top of some of those challenges and, and try to push some of the reforms needed to uh, to make it more efficient. But let me jump into a question and just, again, building on the indictments from yesterday, what's interesting is that the indictments were principally focused on Chinese efforts um, to get insights into American technologies. And so that kind of highlights themes in your report that uh, the technology really is at the heart of the, the US-China um, rivalry um, as both countries strive for some sort of competitive advantage. So let me ask you a question about commercial intelligence. Um, you know, Chinese technology companies have been instrumental to China's uh, rising wealth and influence. They play a central role in, in the US-China rivalry. Um, but as you note in the report, the intelligence communities generally refrain from collecting intelligence on foreign commercial activities. Um, so has this been a mistake um, to, have, to have kind of not de-emphasize that capability over the past? And, and if so, what capabilities should the IC now develop to better understand how China uses commercial tech companies to promote its domestic and foreign policy goals and, and increase its, uh, you know, its, its wealth and its influence? Thank you for the question, Larry. I'll take the first part and let Peter talk about the capabilities. Sure. But to answer, no, it is not a mistake. And there actually has been a lot of IC support in some areas, um, for example, with supporting trade negotiations. But it's important to note that the IC does not carry out commercial espionage for the benefit of US companies uh, because of their constitutional requirements for fairness. And that also in the way that the IC developed after World War II and during the Cold War, this was a context in which the United States was at the forefront of technology and innovation. So it's a different context when we're talking about this commercial intelligence component. There is little reason to give this question as much thought as we are today, except when it was needed to understand Soviet defense capabilities and related industries. But to stay competitive today in the race for actionable insight in the US-China rivalry, commercial intelligence should be considered as part of the equation. And this could include looking into insights into the PRC's trade behavior, key industries and companies, critical supply chains. It could also include looking at the emerging platforms in technology and finance, especially as these platforms, which do collect data, are being exported abroad. Um, mm -hmm. So no, it was not a mistake. And yes, it is critical going forward. Peter, would you like to talk on the capabilities? So we've, we've echoed some, an idea that's been floating around the Office of Global Competitive Analysis that, that Senators um, Warner, Bennett, and Sass proposed earlier this, earlier this year. I think it, it, you know, we put it in terms of a National Techno-Economic Intelligence Center that could serve as a gateway between you know, the, the private sector and the public sector. And, and like our, our recommendation on open source that we're probably gonna get to later, you know, it has the tools built in from the very beginning and you know, to exploit data on a, large, on a large scale. Because we're, you know, one of the interesting things that when you look at the way that we've pursued sort of export controls or individual companies or you know, different issues, we might be able to go deep on, on a company like BGI or Tencent or ByteDance, but our ability to see the entire field and to see all of the different ways in which companies are behaving 
is is often quite limited, right? You know, can we name every single ZTE and Huawei subsidiary that might be doing business or doing you know, what else? And those are you know those are much harder questions. Are we able to keep on track of the kinds of investments that they're making in technology, right? There's a there's an old open source article from Studies in Intelligence that that talked about how open source could be used to uncover a nuclear program because of, at, you know, in the 60s, if you're talking about a $100 million investment at the time, you couldn't hide the commercial features of something like this. Right. And similarly, if we're looking at this, we sh and the PRC is making the kinds of investments that we see in different technologies, in, in AI, in quantum, right? These are things that are, are mappable and are visible because you can't hide that kind of money. And if they're looking abroad to fill those, fill those requirements, and to move technology, their innovation ecosystem forward, then these are things that we should be aware of and should be thinking of, and not just have you know, sort of a, a whack-a-mole approach or something where we're able to, when we spot activity, that we can go investigate it and through right. investigations go deep, but have a much better view of the landscape so that policymakers can forecast economic moves. If we're thinking about different choices like the for, applying the foreign direct product rule, as we recently did, you know, do we understand the implications? Can we game out how this might have an impact? And so I think there's a there's a tremendous. I mean, when you when you look through what people have said from the policy side about having economically oriented intelligence, they've not always been that impressed with the IC, except as it relates to negotiations, things that have sort of have more of a traditional IC component. Mm -hmm. But if technology is at the core of this competition, and understanding these technologies where our rivals are with them, the organizations that field them, is at least as important as understanding the traditional political and military institutions of the state. Right. No, that makes sense. I mean, it's, it sounds like sort of, uh, you know, economic intelligence is generally focused on economic power, economic strength, uh, economic resources. And during the Cold War, as you say, commercial intelligence may very well have been focused on, you know, state-run factories and trying to assess what, what their production rate was because they're producing things of, of military industrial value. But now that kind of commercial intelligence is really focused on some of the core elements of a country's power, which in this case might be artificial intelligence tools, supply chain, um, uh, supply chain capabilities, things that really change the balance of economic power. Um, so rather than look at commercial intelligence to understand what company X is doing for commercial advantage, we're really looking at what company X is doing to strengthen the uh, the economic and political influence of a potential mm -hmm. adversary. Um, yeah. So since you mentioned your the techno a techno economic intelligence center that you cited in the report, let me ask you a question about that because that was I thought a really interesting. Uh, proposal. Um, so the, the 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 center, as you recommended in the report would focus on capturing intelligence on foreign technology and economic trends, sort of the things we've been talking about. But it seems like such a center would would rely almost entirely on open source information, um, or else it would rely on agencies to use their clandestine capabilities to collect that commercial and technological intelligence that we've just discussed is, is valuable in, in new and different ways mm -hmm. nowadays. Um, and, and they haven't done that, you know, to a large extent or generally don't have the, the resources or the expertise to really do that, except principally in the open source realm. So where would the information that this center uh, needs come from and how would and, and how, you know, by creating a new organization, how would how would creating a new organization generate the needed insights in ways that current organizations in the IC can't do? So you forgot two important sources of information. Okay. To, to add on to it. The first would, would be um, commercial proprietary information, right? Because, you know, when, when information has value in the private sector, it often gets monetized and we have to be prepared to step in and pay the same way. The, the government would need to be prepared to step in and pay the same way that anyone else would. Mm -hmm. And the second is the array of, of government holdings that are not necessarily well organized or, or sort of well situated to be made effective use of, right? You know, one of the reasons why commerce is it has been part of a rolling discussion for the last couple of years is because they're in possession of a huge amount of data that would be incredibly useful to other parts of the government or other parts of the commerce department where it's not always where it's not always being used. I think the one of the strongest arguments in favor of of a different kind of center is 
if you're looking at the, at the need to understand the landscape, there's an element of kind of a net assessment and an ability to understand what rivals are doing, what U.S. companies are doing in the same space, right? Because it's the interplay that that becomes per particularly important for for policy decisions, mm -hmm. right? And if you're thinking about how to run a war game or a TTX and to bring these economic issues into it, you're going to need to have some some sense of red on red on blue, and and seeing both sides so both sides of this equation, and for the intelligence community, that is having an understanding of, of what our own side is doing is often a is often a challenging is often a challenging endeavor right you so you end up having sort of a cultural norm against it i've i've heard arguments now on both sides of why it's illegal to do this why it's legal to do this and that it's just a culture thing not actually a, a real rules piece and to give people I think I think the sense of space and purpose to to work on this and to figure out the most appropriate ways it might be best to have a new center that can develop a new analytic identity in terms of how their how their work is done and you know and you know one of the reasons that we're not we're agnostic about where it should sit is that some element of trust with its private partnerships needs to be considered a, a component of, of how this is how this would be put together yeah and and given that it seems like I mean you do mention the commerce department it seems like the commerce department might be a better place than the intelligence community to, to either create that center or to otherwise gather commercial information including proprietary commercial information because they have those relationships with U.S. corporations right they're already gathering it mm -hmm. already sharing insights with companies so does that does that seem like the right home for it and then that information would be shared with the IC because it seems like if you hosted a center like that in the intelligence community or in the ODNI for example there may be challenges to getting companies to collaborate with it. Well, it is, you know, it is and it isn't. I mean, one of the things that SESP has heard in its engagements across the board is that the view of, of Silicon Valley or of the private sector not being prepared to pitch in is is an older, you know, perhaps an older sense of a moment, not a sense of how the United States works. And there have always been government and defense and IC connections on a, on a fairly broad basis, right? So I think that's that's an that's an argument that's there. There's certainly an imperative for commerce to make better use of the information that it has. And you know, I think you could make an argument that having an IC component or a center like this within within commerce that again serves as a gateway between the IC, the policy community, and the private yeah. sector. You know, it's not a bad place to put it, which is why it's one of the one of the sort of suggested suggested opportunities. And yeah. I think even some of the other ideas that are kicking around are around these ideas have you know similarly said, well, commerce has need of either creating a better information service so that it can support itself, or perhaps considering an intelligence component that would be a, a 19th member of the IC and therefore kind of serve as again serve as a gateway. Yeah, because those those departmental elements can often serve as a way to disseminate reporting in clear sort of protected channels that if they were simply passed around at the policy level may or may not be protected in the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, just one last question on the commercial. Oh, go ahead, Megan. I was just going to jump in and say that we also have a chart that lays out all four options for the National Techno Economic Intelligence Center on page 32. And does address some of the pros and cons that come to mind when we look at hosting it in commerce or alternatively, we talked about potentially being in ODNI and two other options. Yeah. Um, so that's a great place to look for those interested. That's great. Yeah, thanks. No, there is a good discussion of the, the as you say, the different options of where to put such a center. Um, so I'd encourage everyone to, to look through the report. It's really pretty comprehensive. Um, one last question on the commercial intelligence question. Um, uh, we have some audience questions coming in, which is great. Please, if you do have questions, please do enter them uh, into the box on the right-hand side of your screen. But we have a question on this from Connor Cole, um, who asks, when you're referring to commercial industry and state-owned enterprises, are you referring to China exclusively, or are you referring to those kind of enterprises in any state? Um, and I suppose there are state-owned, you know, there's a state-owned mining company in the Congo, probably not at the top of the intelligence priorities list, but but nevertheless, what you're arguing could apply to those kinds of countries too. I think it's I think it's pretty clear that it could apply 
to anywhere. It's just, you know, when you, if you're thinking about the United States and our our economic interests as a country, as it relates to national security, as the well-being of the U.S. population, Congo is perhaps, you know, to use your example, is perhaps a slightly different problem than the PRC. And, you know, so it shouldn't be limited to that by any stretch, right? And again, I think if you create the gateway, you create the, you you create a place where policymakers can come to demand if it's useful for Congress, if it's useful for the executive branch, so you can see a push to create something to create something bigger or to have wider coverage. Right? Yeah, makes sense. Um, let me turn to one of the main topics that you addressed in your report, and that's disinformation and the and the role that disinformation plays. Um, that disinformation is being, well, the way our adversaries are using disinformation to undermine democracy in the United States. Um, so, uh, Megan, I think this was an area where you focused on in the in the research. Um, talk to me a little bit about the role, well, first of all, what, what our adversaries are doing, and then the role of technology in disinformation. So, uh, how are adversaries using technology to promote the disinformation campaigns, and how can the IC use technology to counter those influence operations? Yes, thank you, Larry. So in terms of what the adversaries are doing with disinformation campaigns, one trend that we're seeing is the rise of AI-enabled disinformation or the potential for it as we go into the future. And this is the use of large language models and the ability of AI to generate a vast scope and volume of disinformation at a speed that is very difficult to keep up with. And so that is one thing. Another thing that we are seeing as a trend is the creation of GAN-generated deepfakes or um, faked audio and videos that, for example, earlier this year, we saw people Zooming in a conference in Europe with who they thought was a Ukrainian minister, but was actually a deep fake of that individual. So sometimes they're even interactive. So we're seeing the use of these technologies not only to create a an seemingly overwhelming amount of text-based misleading narratives and content, but also in terms of the very videos and photos and audio that we interact with online. And so what the IC can do and what the US government can do to combat that with technology are a number of things. One, large language models. The adversaries are using them. We can also use them. These can be used to identify classifiers within different narratives and themes that are arising on the information domain and to keep at pace with countering and trying to preempt those narratives. Another tool would be using things like AI-enabled databases. Um, DeepMind's retro database is a private one. Comes to mind as a type of model for hosting verified information that can then be used to see how the narratives that are appearing in the information domain may or may not line up with what we're seeing as verified factual information out there. So what's authentic, what's not, how does it all interact? AI can be very useful in helping to determine that at a larger scale. Also, C2PA, the Co Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity, came out with specifications earlier this year about watermarking and creating an immutable ledger that lets you see how a piece of content, and this really has to do at its origins with things like photos, but mm. they're expanding it. So how that piece of content is created, who creates it, when and where it's created, and then as it's edited, who is making those edits? And that could help with attribution. So it's almost like a blockchain in a way where you track every step of the trans every transaction along the way. That's the idea, yes. So to build in some type of technologically enhanced immutable ledger so you know where this content online is coming from. And those are just a number of ways and a number of tools that would be really helpful technologically to help combat disinformation that we're seeing today. Yeah, no, those are great, th those are great applications for technology. Um, so interestingly, in the report, you recommend uh, creating a foreign malign influence center um, as a, a sort of a new way of focusing on uh, countering disinformation. Um, 
and I'm wondering, and it sounds like you to you need you would need a new organization that has the the capability to use these kinds of tools to identify and uncover and reveal uh, foreign uh, technological enhanced disinformation campaigns. So, but I'm wondering how would how would a, a new influence malign influence response center or a joint interagency task force? You mentioned a couple of different ways of organizing. Um, how would this improve on efforts that are currently underway in the government? Like the State Department, for example, has its Global Engagement Center and other agencies have counter misinformation bodies of some sort. Would this kind of new center essentially be tech enabled and tech savvy enough to do the kind of things you've just discussed? Yes, so that's, I have a multi-layered answer to your questions. Okay. Um, the first is that these suggestions would build on the existing coordination and existing efforts of these agencies like the Global Engagement Center, like the FBI's Foreign Influence Task Force or CISA's MDM team. There are a lot of groups that are doing great work. So the goal of our recommendations is to help coordinate that work to create a comprehensive response. Okay. And for the Foreign Malign Influence Response Center, that was actually approved by Congress um, last year and the year before. Um, it doesn't quite fit up with the calendar year, but that is meant to be within ODI and it'll coordinate among all IC elements, including those with diplomatic and law enforcement functions. And this is in section three, uh, 3059 of Title 50 for those that are interested in looking at it. And it's primarily focused on that coordination component. Now, the JIADF, the Joint Interagency Task Force, is a recommendation that came from the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. And the JIADF recommendation builds on what was the original language for the Foreign Malign Influence Response Center, and it enhances it by suggesting that there be a coordination among the State Department, Defense Department, Justice, Homeland Security, and ODNI, and that these entities also work with the FBI, NSA, Global Engagement Center, as you mentioned, in that it draws in existing authorities to create an operations center that has AI-enabled digital tools and expert staff to expose, attribute, and respond effectively to the threats we're seeing online. And so this JIADF would be technologically enabled largely with AI models to be able to keep pace and keep speed in yep. their coordination and their responses. And so that is how we envision these recommendations. We know that the Foreign Malign Influence Response Center was approved. It has not been operationalized. So that would be a first step. The second step would be enhancing it with the recommendations from the National Security Council on Artificial Intelligence for the JIADF. Right. Okay. Um, I want to switch to a, another topic too in the time we have left because you mentioned you spent a lot of time in the report talking about open source intelligence um, and the report highlights the importance of open source intelligence and recommends that agencies both reform their handling of OSINT internally and, and then again creating potentially a new institution in the IC as sort of an institutional home for, uh, for OSINT. So this is sort of the third new organization the report um, recommends potentially creating. So two questions, I guess. How could agencies manage open source differently from the way they're doing it now? And, and how would those be more effective? And then, you know, the IC has created a home, an institutional home for open source intelligence multiple times. So how would the recommendation to create a new one uh, in, enhance what's already being done? Right. Well, thank you for the question, Larry. Um, it's also worth noting that one of the so one of the first questions that we've that SESP has been thinking about, and if you if you looked at the mid-decade challenges to you to US competitive national competitiveness, right? There's a there's a good deal of focus on is the United States organized for the the kind of technological and economic rivalry that we're going into, right? So in some sense, a theme of the first year year of work is that this question of organization. And do we have what we what we need to get there? On open source specifically, you know, we've had sort of foreign document collection centers, we've had the Foreign Broadcast Information Service, we've had the OSC, we've had, we're now on OSE, we now have two, at least two different efforts underway elsewhere in the intelligence community for open source work with different focuses that are on departmental, departmental pieces. But I think the, the issue here is that 
as open source has currently been treated, it's become something where the agency that oversees it, it uses it for its own purposes. And there's not really any open source agency that's serving a national purpose, right? And you know, it's one of those stories of the of the IC. You know, when you look at you know to, to take it for example, the military organizations, you know, the National Security Agency, NGA. NRO, right? They've always balanced between the sense of, okay, here's what we need to do for the Department of Defense, right? But here's what we need to do for a national, a national mission, right? And I think open source is in need of that kind of that kind of organizational center of gravity, where it's not reporting to some to another agency where that may or may not have its best interests at heart mm-hmm. and sort of can build, you know, and so that it can build that capacity. This the area in which when you look at when you look at how open source has been treated it's been treated as kind of like an analytic problem oh well analysts can just go out and, and take care of this and one of one of your guests from a couple of years ago who served as the assistant deputy dni or, or assistant dni for open source elliot jardines when he testified mm-hmm. in front of congress in in 2005 he he responded to, to Dr. John Gannon saying, you know, look, you wouldn't expect all source analysts to go collect their own SIGINT or collect their own imagery. Like, why do you think they can just go do their own open source? And I think you know, we, we've, people have gotten to this view of, well, open source is just, you know, collecting books or collecting articles or anyone with internet connection can do it. Yeah, it's right? a little but deeper it, than that. It's a little deeper than that. Sometimes it is essentially knowing how to effectively exploit documentation. Right. But if 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 we're pursuing kind of a, a national security generalist as our ideal analyst, right, we're we can't assume that such a person is going to have a view or have all of the contextual information that they would need to read, say, PRC newspapers and party journals with the kind of insight that they would need to do. Yeah. Right. And, you know, when you talk to people who remember FBIS, Right. Everyone says their favorite product was the foreign media, the foreign media country guide. You know, where you get a which big to thick document the slant and yeah. Right. And it would give someone who didn't know the system well, or even who, you know, had their MA in, in Russia studies or in China studies or or what have you, it would give them the context, the sort of that detailed context that someone would need to know. Yeah. You know, to understand why, you know, how should you understand, say, a commentary article in the People's Daily? Why is this maybe a little bit different than something that, you know, an op-ed that appears in the Wall Street Journal? Right. Right. You know, we understand some of these things intuitively when they're in societies like ours. But if you were looking at Russia today, if you were looking at India today, if you're looking at Iran, China, and you know, plenty of others where where the political systems are you know, they might have similarities, they might have differences, but their media environments are all unique. Yeah. And so, and that's before you even get to the really fun stuff that's now made available by internet databases and the kinds of things that right. you can now access and dig into, like procurement databases. And right. So those open source analysts really need to be savvy collectors of their own their own research, basically, and understand what they're getting. Yeah. And I mean, if you think about it, when you read, if you read a second report, if you read a human report, context is built into it. When you look at the way that translations have, have been disseminated, there's often not a lot of context. It's just sort of here's the citation information and here's the translation. You know, yeah. Do with it what you will. So we've got, got just uh, a minute for one last question, but it's on this topic that I want to I want to uh, take up. So uh, we have a question from Jetta Breslow who asks about open source intelligence. Um, the idea of creating a new open source center or home. Um, doesn't address the systemic cultural issues that exist within the IC that are resistant to change. So how do you address the, this fundamental issue uh, and have our IC agencies more fully embrace the value of publicly available information? So in, in one minute, try to give me your sense on that complex question of how you change the culture to value open source. I think the first thing is, you know, having respect within a system often comes with having a bit of political power. And we, you know, we're agnostic on exactly the organizational form. It could be within the IC, it could be outside with an IC component, but we were clear that we thought that it should have a voice within the IC, right? You know, the same way that SIGINT and, and, and um, the other ints are represented on the National Intelligence Board, OSINT should be there. 
Yeah. And you know, when you look at some of the community structures, like the NIC, for example, right? Plenty of young analysts from from collection agencies go over to the NIC and serve as associate uh, as associate NIOs to to staff and support and right. understand how the system works, right? Open source open source would need to have those same kinds of opportunities to be there. A third gets to this point that I was just talking about, the, the issue of, of providing the necessary context, right? I think there are plenty of analysts who would be prepared to use it and would use it, but if you're just giving them a, a translation of Xinhua, somebody who's not a China specialist who didn't go through sort of formal training but is doing things on the job and learning on the fly, may or may not get to have the depth of understanding that you need to know the mechanics of why an article or what a publication sort of stands for what it signifies. Yeah. And you know, I think until you build that structure that treats it as a as a real discipline and something that is a collection discipline where you have to provide to the context and understanding around what this information is, then there are always going to be sort of I'm not sure if, if we're even getting to cultural limits yet. We're just getting to structural limits on what people can can effectively do. Yeah. So uh, basically, if you build it, then they will come, or if you build it, they will come around um, to the value of open source. I don't think I've ever met an analyst who said, please don't give me more information. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, that's right. Well, so that's all the time we have, unfortunately. This has been a great discussion. Um, Peter and Megan, thank you very much for joining us today. I do want to encourage everyone who's listening um, to take a look at the SCSP's intelligence interim report. It's available on the website at scsp.ai. It's also posted um, in the chat function um, on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, so Peter and Megan, thanks very much for joining us today, and I'm sure we'll have opportunities to engage with you further in future INSA events. Thank you very much, Larry. All right. So, um, so thanks to everyone for watching online and for taking the time to join us. Um, as usual, when the webinar ends, you'll see a short survey pop up on your screen. So please take a moment uh, to complete it and let us know how we did. Let me just make a few announcements about upcoming INSA events that might interest you. Um, coming up on Monday, November 7th, we will hold our annual speed networking event uh, in INSA's conference center in Arlington. Our keynote, Rear Admiral Tracy Hines, Director of the Cybersecurity Division in the Office of the Chief of Naval Operations, the CNO, will kick things off, uh, followed by four to five rounds of mentoring. So it's a great event, great networking and relationship building program for early to mid-career professionals. Please encourage your junior colleagues to register for the event on INSA's website. Next up on Tuesday, November 15th, we'll host NRO Director Christopher Scalise at our final leadership dinner of the calendar year. Director Scalise will discuss NRO's acquisition needs, commercial satellite partnerships, and I'm told will give some hints as to future contracting opportunities. So please join us for that event. We'll close out November with two more coffee and conversations. On November 15th, I'll be interviewing the Director of Naval Intelligence, Rear Admiral Mike Studeman, about maritime dynamics in the Asia Pacific, new challenges in the Arctic, ONI's use of AI, geospatial intelligence, and other technical tools to understand foreign Navy's capabilities, and the maritime domain writ large. And since Admiral Studeman's previous job was as the J2 at Indo-PACOM, I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to discuss a fair amount of issues regarding China as well. On November 29th, um, we'll host DIA Chief of Staff John Kirschhofer, who will discuss the agency's data and open source strategies, its use of secure cloud computing, and JWICs and IT modernization, among other issues. You can learn more about all of these events at our website, insaonline.org. So this concludes this morning's program. Thanks very much for joining us and have a terrific day.